All right, welcome to this month's user dev meeting, everybody. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this month we'll be focusing on usability and uh, I've the prompt this for this month uh, when I set out the invite was we'll have, um, we added one of our usability topic, our own usability topics to the agenda today. Um, but I also asked uh, all the attendees to um, submit any problems uh, that you're dealing with and stuff. And uh, we'll use this session as a way to brainstorm some ideas around uh, what we can do to fix these problems and um, and also get more. Sometimes it's uh, if, if you submit a, a, a tracker, um, it doesn't get attention or, you know, it isn't seen by the right people. So this is the forum where we'll focus on, you know, getting attention to the right topics. Um, but yeah, today will be mostly used as a brainstorming session where we'll go through, I see a few people submitted topics, so that's, that's great to see. And um, I also want to highlight that we've had a couple issues already come up from the user dev meeting. If you check this uh, link that I just sent. Um, and two of the issues that are CephADM related, those were about um, usability uh, those were actually brought up in the surveys that we sent a while ago, um, where people reported some issues with CephADM usability. And um, both of those trackers were actually mentioned in the CephADM uh, CDS sessions that these will be planned uh, for a focus on the T release. Um, so this is the ultimate goal, again, of um, why we have these usability conversations and um, if we can get enough information together and formulate a plan to solve these problems, um, we put them into a, our plan of action. All right, so I know the first topic, um, the the uh, Gaurav is not on the call yet, so we'll go to the second one from Joel about reducing the data movement caused by adding structural elements. Hey, everybody. Uh, I don't know how big of an issue this is for other operators, but um, we've got a decent size production cluster. It's about 400 OSDs, so it's not giant, but there's enough data in there that data movement is something that I try to avoid primarily because I want to have plenty of cluster resource to deal with any potential component failures. So ideally the data movement would be uh, cluster clients. So we're using just RGW, but ideally the traffic would be RGW reads and writes in and out of the cluster plus any sort of component failure recovery activities. Obviously, there's other kinds of traffic that needs to happen at some times, but um, adding on kind of administratively caused traffic is something that I try to minimize just to preserve resource. So when I originally set up my crush map in the production cluster, um, I didn't include any of the network switch information and down the road, we had a couple network outage situations and troubleshooting that. It was uh, very helpful to know kind of where OSDs and OSD servers were relative to certain network switches. Um, having that information really helps determine kind of what's going on with this particular failure scenario. You know, because initially it's like, okay, what's wrong? So trying to figure out if the network's involved and if it is where it is, is pretty critical in those situations. So having done, gone through a couple of those um, and kind of looking back on how I did the initial investigation to try to sort out what was happening, I figured it would be very helpful to have the switch layout as part of the crush map because that once Seth knows about it, knows about the switch layouts, um, 
you can actually automate some of those responses and search for some of those patterns that I was doing manually. I could automate that kind of pattern search and make it a lot faster to determine if it's a network situation and if it is where it might be. So I went ahead in one of our smaller clusters and added some custom crush buckets to represent switch. I added two, one for top of rack switch, just a standalone switch, and one for um, top of rack switch pair. So we have standalone top of rack switches in some of our dev environments. In our prod environments, they're all switch pairs with M lag, so we have redundancies there. So that's why the two different type of uh, crush bucket for switches. So, you know, adding it to creating those custom buckets was pretty straightforward and easy, no big deal. So that was great. Um, adding them into the crush map and moving them around was also pretty straightforward and not, not an issue really at all. The thing that happened though is what every, pretty much every time you move something in the crush map, Crush does a recalculation and starts moving data. So there may be a way to change a configuration. You know, so like the OSDs have a lot of flags, you know, you can do no outs on OSD, you can do no backfills, you can do no recovers, things like that. So there may be an option like that to just say, hey, just wait till I have all the new buckets where I want them and then just do one calculation um, and one movement that might be an option I'm just not sure but I'm also wondering if there's a way to avoid data movement at all if I'm just adding something like the I don't know if this is technically feasible or not so uh, we'll see but adding kind of where the switches are in the crush structure doesn't really change anything. I mean, it adds information and it obviously changes the way the hierarchy is structured and the way that the internals work, right? Because now as a crush bucket, it needs all the information that a crush bucket gets. So I'm not sure there's a way to actually avoid any data movement, uh, but if there's a way to minimize it, that would be great. Can you um, explain more about what your uh, initial steps of investigation were and how that translates to the switches that you added? Um, that's a good question. I really don't have the details of that in my brain at the moment. Uh, that is something that I could put together and send in to provide that information. Um, I'm actually in the midst of redeploying are like several hundred LSDs I'm part way through. So I just have kind of, my brain is not at its best right now because I've spent the past few weeks doing a fair amount of toil. So this is a different topic entirely, but um, for redeploying OSDs, these OSDs were all built under Octopus. So to get all the disk layout stuff that's current and I'm not fully current because this is actually in, at the end of Pacific right now on this cluster. So I'm a little behind the game in that respect. Um, and so I don't know if this still applies to later releases or not. It may not. But I, I ran into a situation using um, Seth Orc OSD remove replace zap where the process runs up to the point of zapping and then when it's it, zap, it tries to zap an OSD and it, it fails and it just kind of loops on the zap. So because of that, I have to go in and do the manual step of kind of clearing all the LVs off the disk. And then Seth picks it up again. And, you know, I just do a refresh on the device list and the orchestrator and it sees that it's available. It's in the spec. So it picks it up and finishes everything automatically from that point which is great. So that's just a long explanation of saying that, yeah, I don't have those details right now, but I'm happy to provide them. 
So I just uh, I put a question in the chat. Uh, have you tried using this uh, OSD crush initial weight setting? It's meant to do something very similar. You can set it to zero. And if you set it to zero, it won't uh, put any data on it. And uh, to the second part of your question that you want to slowly put uh, data in it so you can slowly increase this weight. So uh, there will be controlled amount of uh, data movement because of the addition of the new OSD. Yeah, that's I, I'm aware of that. And uh, the, the case of adding OSDs to the cluster is not really what I'm doing. I've got, so when I add, going back to the initial crush map bucket thing, I've got a cluster with say 400 OSDs in it and it's a production cluster and it's doing stuff. And I'm not adding any OSDs or taking any OSDs away from the cluster. I'm not making any OSD changes at all to the cluster. I'm just adding basically a non kind of a non-functional layer to the crush map, which is, which is the switches. And my motivation for doing that is to represent those in the crush map so I can operate it on them auto automatically. You know, I can write a script basically to automate the investigation that I don't have the details on right now, but I, I'm happy to provide. Um, so yeah, I'm aware of the disk add kind of use case for that, but I have 400 disks and I don't want data moving around. Do I have to reweight? I mean, I also don't want to interrupt, like if there's a failure in the cluster while I'm making this change, I want the cluster to be able to respond to the failure like it does. I don't want to block that. Yeah, understood. I think um, so in this case, I think it would be really helpful for us to know um, uh, if you were if you're able to walk us through um, a specific example of your cluster with, you know, um, this is the state it's in. These are the initial um, steps of investigation. Uh, this is what I did to uh, add switches. Um, or, or this is this is what I did to you know rectify it in the moment, um, and I think that would help us understand if there's anything uh, or something like OSD crush initial weight or some other knob that that would help in this case, um, or if there would need to be something else added. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I understand trying to figure out a response to what I just said is is kind of hard because it's pretty nebulous right now. I mean, that's maybe an okay high level description that I gave, but like you said, without having a, a better understanding of what was really happening, it's hard to really do anything with that. So yeah, I'm happy to pull that together. And uh, what's the best way to get that to you guys? Uh, def definitely by creating um, like a feature tracker or a, I think there's like a, let's check, but I'm pretty sure that there's a way that you can create, um, oh yes, an enhancement um, bug. I'll send the link okay. here or what, you know, you can, you can even file it just as a bug, but um, that way, yeah. um, yeah, and then uh, what I've done with the other user dev stuff, uh, the other user dev tags is I've um, tagged it with the user dev tag. Um, so I'll send, resend that link. Uh, but you can also just send it to me personally, and then I'll make sure it has that tag so that we are making sure to track it within the, the context of this meeting. Um, and then the idea would be <clears throat> to just, uh, do what you did, like write your problem statement as you as you did just on the Etherpad, but um, also just walk us through a specific example. And really, the uh, important things are, um, you know, the the details of your cluster, um, a crush map if you are comfortable sharing that, and also uh, steps to reproduce 
um, so that we can work to understand it on our side. Um, and even if even if it's more of a complex issue, um, steps to reproduce, at least on your environment, would help us um, kind of evaluate uh, a more base case example that we could work yeah. with. Um, but yeah, a tracker is, is the best for that. And then um, the idea of these brainstorming sessions is, you know, if anybody has any ideas in the moment, we can talk about it. But if it's it's if it's more of a high level thing, um, we can add a tracker about it. And then uh, this will give us, you know, uh, time to, to ask for all the important details and um, also keep the conversation going on that tracker. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I definitely appreciate that. And I'll, I'll submit something uh, when I get all the information together and let you know if I, if I can tag it correctly, that's great. Um, but I think there's yeah, are, are, a likelihood you'll have to fix what I submit. So if, if you can just. Yeah, no worries. Just good. send it to me. It's, it's, uh, if you click on those, any of those examples, you can see the tag, but also just feel free to send it to me and I'll, I'll tag in the right way. Um, okay. Well, if I can't figure it out, I'll, I'll ping you, but I'll take a shot. Sounds good. That. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. You know, again, I don't know how often I doubt people run into this frequently because I don't think based on just nothing really, I guess I wouldn't expect people to be changing their crush maps very regularly. You know, like there was no reason for me to change the crush map in our production cluster for like four years. And then we had a couple network outages over the course of like two or three months. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> that's when I ran into this idea. Um, so anyway, uh, just just a thought, you know, how it stacks up with everything else going on in your world is another story in terms of uh, how useful you think it would be for the community. Well, no, thank, just, thank you for. If I may, go ahead, Radek. Just, uh, uh, just a first uh, impression note. Uh, my rough understanding is that you are uh, you need to uh, introduce some intermediary uh, crash buckets. And this causes uh, uh, your uh, data distribution uh, to uh, s uh, to change significantly. The desired uh, behavior will be to know to avoid the change. What worries me here is that nobody, at least to my knowledge, nobody. This wasn't a design uh, concern uh, when uh, when crash uh, was uh, uh, developed. If so, well, this, I'm afraid to be honest about the complexity growth, but if this is really useful, maybe somebody can try uh, to involve the upmap balancer to have maybe, maybe the new uh, data distribution coming from altering the crash hierarchy. Uh, could be altered back to the initial state by just up maps. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just uh, thinking loudly. However, touching crash and adding features there might be overkill to be honest. That, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, this could potentially not be worth the, le the amount of effort it would take to to do time may be spent better doing other things that's certainly a possibility and up well, maps seems like it may be applicable i mean it's i haven't used that much that's been on my to-do list i have a very long list of things i want to try with seth and i just unfortunately i'm too busy to get to a lot of the trying but up map seems like it might be a candidate for sure Radek, um, can you explain more why uh, why you think that's a good idea? I'm just curious to understand that approach more. Uh, 
there if uh, okay app map uh, uh, was supposed uh, to overwrite uh, uh, the placement coming from crash which basically allows you uh, to take uh, control if the decision uh, is uh, in uh, if the decision about uh, if your will about placement uh, is inconsistent with crash you can overwrite it that's my uh, low level uh, line of thinking here instead of five instead of altering instead of altering the crash somebody could uh, uh, overwrite it may perhaps temporarily to allow gradual migration uh, gradual movement of the data because you know yeah it, finally you don't want to have uh, tons bazillions of up map entries yet for some time might be might be doable and you could in it, it could it, it perhaps it would allow you to uh, uh, finally move to your uh, uh, to the new distribution, but in far more granular way. Yeah, I, I can see that being a, uh, that, that's why in this case, it would be important. F so yeah, Joel, I've done some work on the, on the up balancer or with the balancer in general. Uh, but with this approach, it'd be important for me to know, um, specifically how, um, how you would, uh, or if, if you could walk through in your, you will need right to, your tracker. Uh, okay, now we, up, the, up, the balancer is actually user of app map entries. And app map uh, balancer tries to find, uh, uh, tries to compose a set of entries to achieve particular goal. This goal right now is a very equal distribution, but it's a matter of altering the goal. Maybe you could set instead of a perfect distribution, maybe you could say exactly like the previous one, exactly like this particular one I had in the past. Yeah, I right. think that's I think that's how one of the map scripts works. The one that came out of CERN. My understanding is that it kind of does that. Like when when you when you add a ton of OSDs, for example, to a cluster all at once, and now all the data has to get moved around, it basically calculates the upmap entries that tell the cluster that the initial data distribution is the one that you want, and it just puts all those upmap entries in there for you, and then your cluster's healthy again, and then the balancer just kind of over time, we'll go through and kind of one by one go through those up map entries and move things around slowly. At least that's my understanding of kind of one of those up map scripts. Could be well. It's just a matter of uh, of, of scripting. Uh, the underlying uh, machinery, I think, is the same. Anyway, I'm just thinking uh, loudly. My idea was uh, uh, to uh, try to try to redirect the potential uh, complexity growth uh, from, from critical to maybe less critical part uh, of the system. Crash is problematic because, okay, even the complex, complexity apart. Crash is problematic also because, well, it means updating kernel, kernel clients to finally, get, uh, to finally get everybody understanding, let's say, a new crash bucket. So, the adoption it would be slow. Alex mentioned uh, he linked the PG remapper tool and said we've ha we have a cancel backfills feature. We used to do this. Uh, you do changes with no backfill slash no rebalance and that cancels backfills to remap back to the original, then undo at our own pace. Um, and related to that, I just linked a a tracker. I had been talking with um, Dan Vanderster about this, but about uh, uh, incorporating the logic of the PG remapper, or there's also a tool 
uh, that Dan created called um, Upmap Remapped, but they're they're both similar uh, tools. Uh, but we did have a conversation about incorporating that logic with the balancer module. Um, so again, I would I would need to uh, it, again still be helpful to know your uh, you know walk walk us through your exact use case, Joel. Um, or your ex exact example and what you're looking for, but that planning and this this tool that Alex linked and, and the planning that we have for in the future incorporating this logic might be applicable to your situation. Yeah, that makes sense. That's probably the way to go, actually. It seems like I can probably make use of some of these other remapper scripts that are out there already, at least for the short term. So, you know, I definitely don't want to cause you guys to do any additional work that's unnecessary, knowing that you've got tons on your plate. So. No, it's, it's, it's just about, um, you know, we'll, we'll plan for whatever we need to, but it's, it's just about understanding the problem. And, and we, we have, as the developers, we have a lot more context about what already exists and what, um, what is being planned for. And, it, we'd still need to look into it more, but it looks like there are some possibilities here that um, are of, of existing infrastructure that could already apply to your situation. Yeah, sure does. I'll, I'll check it into those. So thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. And um, if you happen to have any luck with the PG remapper or the upmap remapped tool, um, let us know. Uh, you can also just uh, mention that in the tracker you create. Um, and that'll be helpful since, again, that relates to the work that we're planning to incorporate that logic with the balancer module. Sounds good. What I'll plan to do is um, I'm probably two to maybe three weeks ish away from finishing all these OSD redeploys, but once I get through those and I'll try to circle back to this and try using these tools and kind of experiment with that a little bit and then file a tracker. So hopefully you'll have useful information all in one place for you. I just don't want to file like half a tracker now and then have to update it later. And I'd rather just yeah, set makes one sense. artifact in that's ready for you to look at when it arrives. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Thank you. Any more comments or uh, from from the community or from from users or from developers about this topic? All right. Thanks, Joel, for that. That was very interesting. Um, so for the next topic, we'll go to uh, Zach's ice pick initiative. Hi, I'm Zach. I'm the upstream docs guy. Um, the ice pick initiative is the Robert Ludlum novel title that I've given to uh, Yana, who is ice pick or was ice pick on IRC. Um, he asked if we could make the context instead of help better. And I think he's got a point. It took me a while to understand exactly uh, what he was asking for. But if you run, uh, for example, I, I've listed in the agenda here, uh, Ceph OSD stat help. Uh, the output that you get is, the upshot is it's really long and the only stuff that is uh, immediately pertinent to somebody who's looking for information about Ceph OS, uh, OSD stat is, um, in the monitor commands at the bottom. And so I would like to suppress the rest of it and just present um, the material that is immediately relevant to the command. Maybe add some examples, but that's a longer term goal. Um, my guiding star on this, the template that I will be using or that I have decided to use is the man page for the um, Ceph find command, which is really good and has a lot of uh, Use, usage examples, which is, I think, what people are mostly looking for when they 
They look for online help. They're not looking for reference material. They're looking for uh, like jogging their memory or basic list of uh, commands that apply. Um, now, uh, I will need to learn more about arg parse. I've spoken to Ernesto Puerta about this, and I think he's on leave. I don't know if he's back this week or not. But uh, when Ernesto is back, I will make a um, a plan with him to learn the things about arg parse I need to know in order to start making these alterations. And um, I had rather naively initially thought, well, I'll get the ice pick initiative done by time for the next cephalicon because at the last cephalicon uh, I, had, I had mentioned it and so I, I have a list of uh, the 10 most common uh, uh, 10 very popular maybe I should say I, don't, I can't guarantee that the 10 most popular commands but 10 very common commands that are used Ceph, Ceph Orc, Ceph OSD, Ceph FS, uh, Ceph PG, Redis GW Admin, Ceph ADM, RBD, Redos, and Ceph Volume each of those has a number of subcommands, And so I had naively thought, well, I'll do a set of these and then that'll be the ice pick initiative. Uh, I now, after having surveyed the territory a little bit more thoroughly, I realize, no, the ice pick initiative will be an actual initiative that just continues from now until the end of time or you know, however long I survive. And it'll be just like keeping the English grammar of the documentation up to date as I, as I am able to do uh, this command or that command, it'll just become a part of my day-to-day -day life. Um, so anybody who has any specific complaints about uh, this command or that command's online help output, uh, lay it on me uh, now and forever. And that's it. That's all I wanted to, uh, to say. I think this will probably help the usability to some degree. So I put it in the, in the agenda. I know that it, I didn't clear it with you, Laura, before I said anything about it, but I'm, I'm announcing this now. Yeah, it's, it's really bad that you put that in there, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I, I did it to um, hurt us all. Totally. Um, no, it's, I, I asked for the community to put problems in here. So this is really nice to see. And um, so it looks like this is just one example of what you're hoping to improve, right? This uh, OSD stat help. Yeah, this output. is the pilot. This is the pilot example. Uh, when we crack the arg parse nut, then I will, I, I have a, this is no kidding. I have a, a VSTAR cluster that's in an Intel NUC uh, laptop in the other room. And I have a handwritten list. Uh, I, I do everything in the worst, like least efficient way. I have a handwritten list of outputs that I would like to see for various commands. Um, as soon as this first one is done, then I will create another tracker bug, which will be an umbrella tracker to track all of these things. That tracker will probably never close. Um, it'll just remain open as a place to list all the, all the places where we've cut out the I guess I want to say irrelevant material. Like, I mean, it's it's all relevant to the running of a Ceph cluster, but it's not in this particular example, you know, directly relevant to Ceph OSD stat. I'd also like, um, I think I've mentioned this in the tracker. Uh, I want the the output to be explained line by line so that someone who's never seen it before can at least get some information from it. But again, this like first things first, we learn by we, I mean I learn arg parse and figure out how to how to alter these strings. Um, then I probably go from team lead to team lead, making certain that I'm not stepping on any toes. I don't want to make anybody angry. And then uh, so once we have the the technical know how and then the political okay from everybody, this is just a, an initiative that runs in the background continually just like a, like a human cron job. That's it. I, I just gave another talk. I didn't mean to, sorry. Oh, that's, that's, that sounds really nice. And, um, and yeah, when you have the umbrella tracker and um, that would be good, I think to share with the community so that community members can add any commands that they think where they think the help output should be improved. Yeah, and 
I guess the this will be the the third and final thing I say about this. Um, I I will I will I, like as soon as as soon as this one thing has been done, and like we can prove that we can split the atom, then I will create the index of atoms that we would like to split. Uh, if possible, I would like to make it so that anybody could just cut out the stuff that they find irrelevant and create a pull request. I don't know how tricky that's going to be yet. That's a question for a future version of me. So that I don't have to do every one of these things because it's, it's uh, probably going to be incredibly tedious. Right. Just as an umbrella question, does anybody on this call have any particular issues with any of the help output that they can, that you can think of, or uh, is there anything that's verbose about the CLI commands? I'm going to take right. that as well, a no, no. Maybe that'll be a, a something that uh, may, maybe it's something that everybody's gotten used to over time. But um, I think it'll still be helpful to streamline this output and make it more readable or more consumable. Sounds Informed. good. Are there any more uh, any more comments about this initiative? It's a nice initiative. I think uh, we'll need to revisit it again from a fresh perspective, revisit the Ceph commands from a fresh perspective to see how we can uh, raise improvements uh, and share it. Uh, yeah. Thanks for highlighting and sharing. Awesome. Yeah, if we just cut out all that general stuff at the front, I think it'll make it much better. I mean, that's that's almost scriptable. Great. All right, I think we can go to the third topic on the agenda from Gaurav about Ceph dashboard usability improvements. Hi everyone, I'm Gaurav, I'm part of the Self Ambassadors program. Um, we brought this up in um, a, sh a short, sh I think, discuss this a bit in the ten uh, developer summit in the Tentacle, but I'll just share uh, some of the light again on this. That I mean, in the dashboard, um, from a user perspective, uh, I'm proposing that uh, let's, um, I mean, if a user who opens a dashboard, opens a Ceph dashboard and wants to understand from a fresh perspective, from an application perspective, uh, without understanding the internals of Ceph and they want to understand the usage. For example, um, if, they, uh, if the application is RBD and they are from application side, uh, they are only consuming 50 gigs where, I mean, it's, if it's a, um, three and let's say taking the application fa factor into account, we have three OSDs in the cluster, so it's a overall total size, so capacity of the cluster will be uh, 300 gigs, but the usable capacity will only be 100. And from an application perspective, the user will be concerned about how how much they have used uh, at a high level. So having an application overview of that dashboard can it can be really great. Um, if I can share my screen, I've prepared some diagrams, um, one or two diagrams that I can uh, share. Is that okay, Laura? Yeah, go for it. So please let me know if my screen is visible. I think, yep, this is a diagram. Okay, I need to rotate this. Um, I see a black screen. Oh, me too. 
I'll stop and start again. Can you let me know if my screen is visible now? Yes. Uh, are you able to see the diagram there? Yes, it is 90 degrees, but yes, okay. it is right. readable, right. legible. I'll rotate this a bit. So let's say uh, we want to have an application overview from our BD perspective. I mean, we have three types of applications, right? Block, object, and file. Once we click, we have, we, uh, what I'm proposing is, on a high level, we want to have three panels for each type of application, and we can dive into detail. And then, for the, so the uh, dive into the application overview and see how much that application is consumed. But the I think one of the problems that we, I found out that we are having is that um, the same application name can be used for multiple pools, and I think taking into various vari uh, factors into account, which are variations on the basis of replicas and EC profiles, and definitely the type of tiering as well. So what I propose, one of the ideas that we should have a unique application uh, associated with a pool that can help in uh, getting this application over you in a much more easier way. I, that's something. Um, but it will be great to have more feedback, and I just want to brainstorm with all of you um, to get to get feedback on. Is this even does this even make sense for the users who don't understand the internals of Ceph but still want to understand at a high level how much their applications are consuming? The other diagram I have, yeah, but I think the major diagram is this one. That uh, yeah, but it'll be great to have everyone's thoughts and feedback. Um, Any comments about this? Yeah, that will help. Will be helpful for user perspective. Maybe uh, an example, uh, can you explain kind of or walk us through your diagram again? Because um, I think I'd need a, uh, another explanation. So let's say if a user is having a, um, is, consume, is, is hosting a, maybe a MongoDB on RBD, and they want to know that, and we have multiple types of applications in the same cluster, um, RBD based, RGW based, and CFFS based. But from a RBD perspective, from a block perspective, you want to know that how much is my DB consuming at a high level. So, if, for example, if I'm you, if I have two images which are you 40 gigs, I want to understand. Uh, I mean, that I've come consuming 40 gigs uh, instead of 120 gigs. I think on a, at a pool level. I'm still consuming 120 gigs if we talk from Ceph perspective, but from an application perspective, I'm still consuming 40 gigs, right? Um, at a basic level. I see. So you're you're yeah. looking at pool, or I mean, at uh, usage per application. Yes, usage per application at a high level, and then if um, then if a user is having um, the uh, good good self skills, then they can further dive into the pool details. But I think it's a layer above uh, our pools um, uh, grouping grouping the pools basis uh, on the, on the application basically focusing on the application that can be helpful for the users. Maybe this can be answered by. Uh, other developers in the call, but um, my question would be, would it make sense to group applications together? Uh, like, does that tell us something? Or, or is there, uh, 
would it make more sense to keep it divided by pool or is it is it useful to see applications grouped together like this? The, the reasoning behind that is that, I mean, we'll have an overview from an application perspective. Um, we can just, from, from a user perspective, it'll be easier to go into RBD and then look at their RBD based workload uh, or in usage based on their application, then they can go into RGW and it could be much more cleaner overview from their application perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. Here's a question for the users um, on this call. How do you normally check into your into your usage and what could you see be done differently about it? Or do you like how it is at the moment? And this is specifically about dashboards. So I guess the dashboard users. First off, are, are there any dashboard users on the call? Maybe that's a question I, sh I should ask. Yeah. I typically don't use the dashboard for a lot, uh, but there is some information in there that is useful that I can't get from command line. I tend to do stuff command line because I want to automate things if I can. So understanding possibilities for automation which in my case means scripting. I'm not an application developer, but I script as much as I can for automation. Um, but one of the things I really do like in the dashboard is you can see activities in the pools and you kind of see the read, write and get breakdown of per pool, uh, <clears throat> you know, read, write activity. So that's one thing I look in there in the dashboard for a lot. Uh, but otherwise, I stick mainly to command line. I see. So it seems like um, I think it, this uh, particular question about dashboards might be out of scope for just the attendees of this call. But this could be worth sending an email out to the user list, and we could also do. Um, like a survey about it, um, about dashboard usability in general, if that's something that we'd want to pursue, just since um, we'd want to get, you know, feedback from people that are actually using the dashboard on a day to day basis. Um, yeah, sure. I think that would be great. And I can prepare one or two slides on this and just clean up the diagram a little, prepare it. Um, sure. I mean, just prepare slides and just share a proposal when one or two slides and uh, we can roll out an email and that, that sounds really great. It'll be, it'll be nice to get everyone's perspective. And, yeah. yeah, I think that'll be really important because it seems like m most or all the people on this call um, <clears throat> just use the command line. So that wouldn't be uh, we, we definitely want feedback from actual dashboard users on this. So yeah, I think that uh, if you're um, okay with sending an email out or if you're interested in creating a more general survey around it, um, I think that will be really helpful for us in getting more accurate feedback. Yeah, I have one more question out there in the open actually, as we are not dashboard users or as many of us are not dashboard users, what will enable us to become the dashboard users and how would, how do we, what do we look forward to see in the dashboard so that we would want to troubleshoot via the dashboard? I'm just coming from a um, um, dashboard first mentality here, um, just trying to think from that philosophy that, um, I mean, how we can make our user experience really uh, great. Uh, and uh, I mean, the things that we use CLI for, right? I mean, some of the things that can be incorporated in the dashboard for troubleshooting. What are the things that we look forward and what, I mean, would want to see in the dashboard for our day-to-day -day troubleshooting?
yeah, so if anybody is wants to to um, answer that, like just in a in a general, um, if you're a CLI user, why do you prefer do you prefer the CLI first of all, and if so, um, why is that over using the dashboard, and what what can can be done to change that? On our site, we haven't installed the dashboard, I think. I never used it. So we just rely on CLI and our metrics. Yeah, in my case, there may be things in the dashboard that I just haven't discovered yet. Um, <clears throat> I've gone through it a few times just looking around and I've, like I said, found the IO by pool, which is really helpful. Um, but again, I'm, I really want to try to understand more. My focus is not so much my own user experience or even kind of ease of use, really. It's my main focus is understanding how Ceph behaves and being able to predict how the cluster will behave under certain circumstances so that I can hopefully set things up to avoid problems down the road. So <clears throat> my perspective is maybe a little bit unusual because of that. Um, but I also think there's potentially uses for the dashboard that I just haven't figured out yet because I'm spread too thin and haven't gotten to it. Cool. So what I'm hearing so far is just that it's uh, it's a seems to be a learning curve that that some users are just haven't taken yet. I've heard some feedback before too about scalability, but I'm not hearing that on this call specifically. Um, but I know that's been something that's been brought up in the past. Um, yeah, if uh, um, that might be, Gaurav, that might be something that would be uh, interesting for us to do also a survey about um, dashboard usability and what we can do to, you know, um, have more people adopt it. Uh, but it sounds like so far that it it's just hasn't been uh, necessary or, or people aren't aware of certain features that the dashboard offers. So we could also take up an approach of doing more uh, live demos about how to use the dashboard and what what features are available because there are a lot of differences uh, between the dashboard and relying solely on the cli there are a lot of cool things that you can do with the dashboard so perhaps we need to just do more publicity around that kind of stuff yeah and i'm thinking around user stories and uh, uh blog posts as well around that um just um because recently i was going through um a set of user stories. Uh, I think uh, what I found out was that the uh, last user story which which we had was a while ago, and uh, it would be great to have uh, those. I think in general, but also from dashboard perspective, um, so that I think we can. Uh, um, I mean. Uh, the Ceph community can be educated, uh, the Ceph community members can edu be educated from issues perspective to find out that if you're facing an issue, how dashboard can be used to troubleshoot things faster and how we can um, improve the usability to make troubleshooting easier. I think that's something that I also look forward to. Uh, uh, I mean, sharing more ideas and if there are any trackers, I'll definitely open um, while discussing with the dashboard I think it will be great to have suggestions in, the, in those areas where you would want to see our dashboard. Yeah, and I would just add another reason I haven't done a lot of dashboard stuff. I mentioned earlier that uh, we're running the, the probably last version of Pacific, so I'm way behind the curve in terms of the development on a lot of these things. So the dashboard I'm looking at is like some historical thing at this point, right? Um, once I get caught up 
then uh, it's probably more useful for me to see what's there and participate in feedback about it because I'm sure there's been a lot of improvements and changes that I just haven't seen yet. Yep, I was testing the Squid RC one and the dashboard is really nice. I think there's some um, imp a, a great improvements that have been uh, there. But I think there's a lot more can be improved as well. This might be one thing we could do at Cephalicon as well in terms of like the latest. I know there's a new landing page, etc. that probably some folks have uh, not seen yet. So uh, maybe like do some pop-up sessions and things uh, so that folks who are running an older version can just you know get a feel of new things. Yep, I think that'll be great. That'd be cool. Yep. All right, we've got still three minutes left, but any more, uh, any more to add to this topic or to any of the topics we've discussed today? Or something new? All right, if not, Thanks for a really great session today, everybody, and I'll see you all next month. Thank you, Laura. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks very much, everybody.